Welcome to Toronto Centre's webinar on digitalization of finance. This is the second uh, webinar, uh, five webinar series that we're doing on the revised Basel Core Principles. I am Babak Abbasada, CEO of Toronto Centre, delighted to be uh, opening this. We congratulate the Basel Committee on updating the core principles, reflecting priorities of mitigating financial risks, strengthening macroprudential supervision, promoting operational resilience, uh, reinforcing corporate governance and risk management, addressing new emerging risks, including digitalization of finance and climate risk. And um, today we're focusing on digitalization. Advances in digitalization and financial technology continue to transform and disrupt the landscape of the financial system. While digitalization can benefit both banks and their customers, it can also create new vulnerabilities and amplify existing risks to banks and financial stability. This calls for stronger vigilance by supervisors. Today, our distinguished panel will discuss regulatory and supervisory implications of innovative technologies and their applications, as well as new competitors and business models. We have assembled a very, very strong team and uh, we've known them, we've seen them at our program, so they've been tested. Socorro Heisen, Superintendent Banks, Insurance and Pension Fund Administrators of Peru is one of our speakers. And she's also a member of our board of directors here at Toronto Center for Global Leadership and Financial Supervision. Our friend Francesca Hopwood Road is the head of the BIS London Innovation Center. And this conversation is moderated by our good friend and uh, board member, Jennifer Elliott, who's the advisor at the Monetary Capital Development Markets of IMF. Jennifer, uh, as I mentioned, is a member of our board and a frequent moderator. She does such a good job that she keeps uh, getting dragged into this. So welcome to our speakers and moderator. You have seen their bios. Now it is my pleasure to hand the platform over to you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thanks, Babak. It's always great to be at the Toronto Centre where we we have the opportunity to talk about issues really in front of supervisors and central banks and issues that are, are, are kind of issues we're all still finding our way through. So the Basel Committee finally taken FinTech into the standards that we use to benchmark supervision around the world. But of course it's a moving target, right? So um, we're here to talk about that moving target. And I'm gonna start with a question for you, Francesca. Because the BIS has set up these innovation hubs to kind of track and think about new technology and what it means. So tell us what's happening at the, the London BIS hub, what you guys are thinking about and what your priorities are. Uh, thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you to the Toronto Centre for inviting me to join you all today. It's a real privilege uh, to be with you uh, and joining so many colleagues from around the world. Um, so, yes, Jennifer, in London, um, perhaps I can zoom out a little bit and talk about the Innovation Hub. Um, we work across six domains, uh, all the way from central bank digital currencies, financial market infrastructure, supervisory technology and regulatory technology, all the way through to green finance. Um, and uh, in London, we have been up and running for about two and a half years now. So we're kind of one of the younger siblings of the seven uh, centres that make up the Innovation Hub. Um, and our areas of focus are in kind of three key areas within those six. So one of our first projects was a project Rosalind, which looked at retail CBDC. We've also been look, doing some work in the uh, next generation financial market infrastructure space. But I think what's really pertinent for today's call is the work that we've been doing uh, on the supervisory technology and regulatory technology side of, of the house, if I can put it that way. Um, uh, and what we've been looking at is how we can develop um, uh, tools, proof of concepts, prototypes that really support uh, supervisors uh, and regulators in emerging areas of regulation principally. So, you know, we've been looking at uh, digital assets. So for example, in London, we have Project Pixdrill, which will be uh, launching the report next month. So do please look out for that on our website. And that's looking at how we can develop tools to support the monitoring of stable coins, because we know that around the world, uh, legislation and regulation uh, to support uh, the monitoring of stable coins is coming into force. Uh, and so we've been really thinking about how we can go on the front foot, if you like, and take a technology first approach to supporting our supervisory colleagues uh, with a tool that will en enable them to see the assets and liabilities behind stable coins and help them to monitor that. 
and that motif actually is something we see quite a lot across the across our work in the innovation hub more broadly around supervisory technology where you know whether it's our colleagues in the euro system who with project atlas our colleagues in singapore with their with their work in the climate space looking at how we can support supervisors with these emerging areas of that are coming into our regulatory perimeter uh, around uh, green finance but that being said, we also recognise deeply that there is a significant hinterland, isn't there, of issues around regulatory reporting, AML, financial crime, which also require uh, a lot of, uh, of of thought and work to really continue to boost that. And we, uh, and so in London, we have been doing a lot of work to think about what the hub-wide strategy to subtech is and how we can really support um, our colleagues. Uh, in experimenting with technology on some of those knotty, thorny problems that have maybe plagued us for many years and how we can really bring technology to the fore. Um, and so perhaps later on in the conversation, I can delve into that in a bit more detail. Thanks, Francesca. It's That's super nice that you, that you added this idea of opportunities for supervisors from technology because sort of fighting technology with technology seems like a, a positive. And I, I don't mean to say that technology is just a risk. We all enjoy the benefits of technology. So that's fantastic, thanks. We're gonna go to Socorro for the sober look at supervision on the front line. So Socorro, given all your experience, many years of supervision, not just in Peru, where of course you're, you're, you're heading supervision there, but also internationally. So from your perspective, from the front line, how do you see banks dealing with mitigating the op risk as stemming from technology? Well, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, first, let me give you a little bit of context. Um, digitalization of finance is growing at a very fast pace in Peru, as in with, um, most of other countries. Uh, the use of cloud computing, APIs, apps are broad based. And let me give you just a couple of examples of the, the, the deep changes that are taking place. Um, uh, for instance, uh, we follow statistics of the development of new products or changes, significant changes in products in Peru. And only in 2023, uh, well, the changes or new products increased by, 20, by 60%. And we received 496 risk reports on these changes on products. That's a lot for one single year for about the 60 institutions that we that we have uh, in, in, in Peru. 34% uh, of these changes were related to digital transformations. Um, also, the use of models has grown significantly in Peru. There are 972 models you being used in Peru right now on the credit risk without counting the other models. 61% uh, of these models are used by systemic banks, by the five systemic banks we have. So, and 20% of the models are based on new, very new technologies. So, this is an example of, of the changes that we are seeing. The most common uses for models are loan approval, pricing. A border segmentation, um, things like that. So, um, how do we deal with this? Well, first of all, we, we have a, a very robust supervisory approach, which generally aims at uh, being regularly updated, updated to follow uh, the new risks that we see, the new uh, problems that we are identifying, and of course, the changes in international standards. So we uh, update every year our strategic plans uh, to fine tune the priorities, to, to, to see what needs to be done faster or slower. Um, and we also review our regulation regularly. For instance, in 2021, we, we changed our uh, information security and cyber risk regulation, and also in, uh, to introduce uh, digital onboarding, authentication requirements, requirements for APIs and things like that. And also we enhance regulations governing uh, service providers. And, and more recently in 2024, we have issued a, a new regulation requiring banks to manage the risks from models, from the use of models. 
And, and I mean, this is clearly important for us given the broad-based uh, expansion of these models and the intensive use for approval of credits and, uh, and pricing of credits. So uh, this is key for us. And right now uh, we are uh, also welcoming the, the approval of the BCPs by the Basel Committee. And we are reviewing our operational risk uh, regulation, which probably will be issued in 2025 to introduce a concept of operational resilience and to enhance uh, again, the requirements for third party providers and the management of change. So these are some of the things that we, we are doing. Um, um, we have a team of specialized supervisors and we do follow this, they follow very closely the, the management of change by banks. We have risk reports for new products or significant changes in products that banks have to do conduct themselves and later on they have to give us a report on, on all these changes so that we can try to see uh, which things are changing in the system, uh, which innovations are taking place and, and, and examine whether we feel that there are some risks that are being missed in these changes. So this is an important part of uh, these product reports, pro risk product Reports of, re of new products are, are an important part of our supervisory process. Another important part of our supervisory process is the uh, operational um, um, losses um, matrix that we receive uh, on a quarterly basis. And so we can follow also what is going on in the system. So basically these are, these are uh, some tools that we are using uh, to, to deal with operational risk uh, in, in, in our system. So it's interesting, uh, you're talking about the use of technology, then thinking about change management, risk management, and some of that is technology and some of what's in your toolkit is technology, but some of it is is just a, sort of a governance concern, right? How are you right. managing it? How does the bank have the capacity to manage it? So I'm gonna throw you both a extra question you're not prepared for. And that's that's a that's a question of it, when you think about soup tech, which I you know really is appealing. Authority uh, you know authorities don't have enough resources. Technology moves fast. The, the data sets are huge. All of those things. So you can see that technology's got to be part of the solution. But in in terms of of those in the audience who are working in supervisory organization, what do they need to think about in embedding soup tech? Then I mean, thinking about what Socorro is talking about. Uh, governance issues, change management, risk management thoughts. Um, sorry to to throw you a question that wasn't on the on the list. Socorro, what are you thinking well, about? <laughs> well, I mean, clearly the constraint, uh, the the key constraint is resources, and and really we do have to prioritize because we do not have resources to do all the things we want to do. I mean, we have a long list of things that gets. It keeps getting pushed down the line because all the more important things comes up. Yeah. Uh, and so we have to make decisions. And uh, we, we, we have a strong team of specialized supervisors on operational risk, on information technology risk, also on model risk. But they are not uh, enough to do all the things we do. We, we also use uh, uh, international cooperation and assistance from multilateral institutions or and from other countries that are helping us in some in some uh, some aspects uh, that 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 helps a lot uh, and uh, it, it's difficult in capacity building we, we we do as much as we can on this on these issues uh, this this leads us to Francesca then it's very cool that the BIS is working on that on an international basis because it helps. So Francesca, what do you think about those risks of embedding soup type? It, this is this is such an important question, Jennifer, and I'm so pleased you asked it because I think, you know, I've been working in and around the field of sub tech now for the last five or six years. And you know, I was at the UK's Financial Conduct Authority where I, I led their sub tech and reg tech program for, for several years before I joined the innovation hub at the BIS uh, a few years ago. 
Um, and I think, you know, what we have seen with SupTech is we have seen lots of experimentation. We have seen lots of proof of concepts. We have seen lots of people get genuinely excited and, and rightly so about the art of the possible. You know, the, the points exactly as, you know, as Sakura mentioned and as you've mentioned about, you know, what it can enable. But if I was, to be honest, a couple of years ago, I was feeling a little downhearted because I was thinking, OK, well, this is proliferation of experimentation. But are our supervisors really reaping the benefits of this? Is this really being able to strengthen their hand um, in terms of automating those manual processes, in terms of helping them apply their judgment in those fields where, you know, that is that is their kind of their expertise? And, and, and how do we enable that to happen? Um, and I was a little worried that we were kind of in a cycle, uh, not not with any criticism attached of experimentation, but we weren't really moving it out. And part of that, I think, was because a lot of these tools were being developed for supervisors, but not necessarily with supervisors. They weren't being developed, you know, hand in glove with the people who were going to be using them. And I think what we have seen over the last couple of years, and I am delighted about it, I can't tell you, is that we're now not having a conversation about the technology. We're having a conversation about the people. I think we've proven out that the technology can do most of the things that we want it to do. Yeah. Now it's about saying, you know, but our people are the ones that are going to be using the technology. It's there are supervisors in the front line who need to be equipped with this. Has anyone asked them what they need to do, to, what they would like and how this is going to, you know, when they come in on a Monday morning with their cup of coffee, what is it going to look like on their workbench? How are they going to integrate this tool? Do they need this tool? Or is it is, is it a tool that, you know, some brilliant people, but in a technology function have thought up that not necessarily thinking about how our supervisor is, are going to use this. So I think we're now starting to see much more of that co-location between our, our, our SMEs, our supervisors and our technologists. And I am delighted about that. But I think then what you get to is the next challenge, is, which is how do you get that stickiness of adoption? So Coro talked um, so astutely about the you know, the the kind of constraints and the challenges we face, you know, and, and so how are you really smart about making sure that the tools that you invest in then stick with your frontline supervisors so they can use them and they can shorten that, you know, that path around the manual effort that is often, you know, a big part of a, a part of role. So I think there is now a really important conversation about the people and culture change required to kind of engage that. What kind of skills adoption do we need? You can tell I'm passionate about this. I'm sorry, I'm getting all excited. Um, this kind of skills that you need for your supervisors to really think about how do they harness and use these, these every day? Um, what kind of supportive skills do they need around them, around, you know the comms and the and, and the business change and all and all of those pieces, um, so that these this this investment that often organisations are having to really judiciously make. You know where are they going to spend? You know resource that is tight uh, uh, in the right places and in the best places. And I think I'm really heartened to see that we are now moving out of a cycle of experimentation into production, and that more and more we are having a global conversation about. And it's hard, but what is the, how do we really get that stickiness of take up and adoption of the tools that we're developing? That's I'll stop fantastic. there. But yeah, oh, no. I could go on, as you can see. You know, this is this is a place for people who are excited about supervision, so it's good. Uh, <laughs> so let's let's move to uh, let's move to thinking about uh, how the industry might be changing as a result of, of technology. So, Sigoro. How do you see competition in technology enabling new entrants, or is it what what I have observed in some countries, which is once the technology looks good, the big guys buy it up, and you don't have that, <laughs> that competition. So what what are you seeing, like in Peru? What have you seen, and maybe in the neighborhood? Yeah, the, there's a lot of that of, of buying up or partnering uh, with startups. Uh, in, in Peru, we have three main areas, I think, in which uh, new entrants compete with banks. Uh, payments, currency exchange, and credit. Those are the main, the main drivers. Um, on, on payments, there are many applications both operated by banks and by uh, startups. And, um, but the, the ones operated by banks have the the biggest chunk of the of the of the market, 
uh, much more traffic. Uh, in early 2023, the Central Bank of Peru, which is a regulator of the payment system, uh, approved a, a regulation requiring uh, these all these apps to be to have interoperability so that they could talk to each other because at the beginning they were talking among uh, among themselves basically or in very few clusters uh separated and but so once this uh interoperability regulation have has come into place in a gradual uh uh process uh, what we have seen is an explosion of payment uh transit and for instance uh, in in 2019, we had 500,000 transactions a month taking place in the country in this, through digital wallets. Uh, in March 2024, we have 475 million only in one month. So it's it's really a revolutionary change that, that the one that is taking place. Uh, it is most impressive right now in urban areas along the coast, but uh, little by little it's starting to percolate to, 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 to rural areas. So I think this, this we, we're, we're only seeing the, the tip of the iceberg in, in, in this process. Uh, the, the second aspect is currency exchange. In currency exchange, the, the apps have been very successful in, in attracting especially young people uh, because they have lower margins, um, and, and, in, and, and they are very fast to do a currency exchange, dollars versus sales. And uh, so, that, uh, in this aspect, the banks were a little slow, but now they have already catched up. Uh, they are they are giving lower prices in their apps. They have introduced currency exchange in their apps, and they are giving better rates in their app, digital apps than in the branches. So that they are fostering customers to go to the apps. Uh, so this is evolving to uh, also the banks squeezing the market again. And then on, on loans, we have uh, not, we have a lot of loan applications, but we have not identified companies that can really make a dent in what the banks are doing. Uh, and, and there are some, some mixed reviews in, 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 in these loan applications. Some are well established, like uh, Presta Pime, who has uh, a lot of customers. It's, it's been operating for several years. They have about two hundred million dollars of credit. Uh, it's, it's still small relative to the size of the market, but it, it it is it is it is working. But there are others that come and go very fast. You know, they start and they come and go. And among those that are come and go, uh, more recently we have a lot of fraudulent applications that offer these cheap loans and, and really what they are doing is blackmailing, extorting people, charging huge interest rates. They are really uh, criminal organizations that are, uh, and, and, and we do have a challenge with those. Everybody has a challenge with those because it's given a bad reputation to loan application because, because people do not know whether a loan, a FinTech that grants loans is, is legitimate or it's fraudulent, uh, we are giving every month lists of these applications to, to consumers, the, the, the ones that are fraudulent to try to alert consumers of what, the ones that we have identified that are, are fraudulent, but it's always a catch up. And then there you have uh, some of these companies advertising YouTube in Facebook in different applications uh, so and you can download it in this Google Play Store or Samsung Play Store, Apple Play Store, and uh, and and then we we talk to the big uh, service providers. After a while, they take the application down after we tell them that it's fraudulent. But it takes a while, and immediately they change the name of the app, and they have another one. So it is a huge challenge. So, uh, in general, let me let me go back to the question. In general, what you have is the large banks being ahead of the curve. In gen in in general, and uh, some of the smaller banks, especially microfinance institutions, feeling some squeeze of their competition, because especially because the the 
these new technologies require a lot of capital, a lot of muscle to be able to, to grow, to innovate at the pace that these people are doing it. And so the ones who cannot innovate at that fast pace are, are feeling the competition. But the rest of the, the bigger size of the market, the big ones are, are really in good shape so far. That's what we're looking. So it's very interesting because you started with a, a policy that changed things, which is interoperability, right? That really, mm -hmm. it's not yeah. just industry driven. It's also what policymakers can do, which is interesting. But then, of course, the industry. Um, and yeah, I think we do have to recognize that the downside is the fraud, which is which is everywhere, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Fraud. And, and then, you know, even the most financially literate can get caught up in that that sort of stuff. So um, all right. So, Francesca, you already told us quite a bit about what your priorities are and what you're working on. Uh, and it was really fascinated by the stablecoin monitoring, because that is a little bit on the cutting edge for regulators and also in financial innovation. So can you tell us a little bit more about how you're thinking about what you see gaps and how you're, you're thinking about addressing mm -hmm. those gaps in the sort of mm -hmm. ecosystem of the financial sector? Absolutely. So um, one of the things that I think is very important in the subtech space is, you know, thinking about the so the role and remit that we have as the Biz Innovation Hub is to experiment with technology in order to create public goods for you as supervisors and central banks to consume. Um, so you are our customers. <laughs> Um, and so um, what is terribly important uh, in, the, in the supervisory technologies, you know, part of our remit for us is to be to think about um, how do we really understand and marry up your needs so that we're creating um, uh, we're creating public goods that, that meet your needs with with the technology. Um, and so we've been doing uh, a lot of work over the last uh, few years to uh, think about how we can best kind of affect that in the supervisory technology space. Um, uh, and later this year, what we're going to be hosting in October in Switzerland is a tech sprint. And I noticed there was a question that popped up uh, from a colleague, uh, a participant about kind of what are some of the tools and techniques we can use to support. And tech sprints are one very, very good and effective tool that we can use. What is a tech sprint? A tech sprint is essentially bringing together mixed teams of different disciplines. So you might have technologists, you might have data people, you might have subject matter experts, in this case, supervisors, and you bring them together around really tough problems. You bring them together. I won't say you lock them in a room, but you know, not far off for a couple of days and you get them to think hard, probably with cold towels on their heads about the challenges you face to create at the end a proof of concept or a prototype. And we really want to bring, you know, this, these are often industry, these often work really well with industry. But what we're doing in October is we're bringing together for the first time, I think, I think I can say that, um, a tech sprint for supervisors. So we're inviting the supervisory community from across the world to come together in Switzerland. We have done a lot of work over the past three or four months to really understand where are the common pain points but also common opportunities that people want to gather, want to come together around. Because, you know, again, back to Socorro's point, in a world that is quite constrained around resources, if we're going to create proof of concepts for colleagues on this call to hopefully use and consume and get value from, we want to make sure that it's meeting your needs. We don't want to create something that we mm -hmm. think is a great idea, but actually, you know, you you guys tell us, you know, it's not it's not meeting our needs. So we've been doing a lot of work. Uh, with over 25 different jurisdictions over the last three or four months to really get into the detail of what are what are the common pain points. And then we're going to be bringing together teams together in person in Switzerland later this year over two days to go after these and at the end of them hopefully create a suite of proof of concepts that we can then pick up and further develop knowing that they are already aligned to the things that our colleagues in the supervisory community care about. And I think that's that's hugely important because of the resource constraints that Socorro has already talked about, but also because of this challenge, again, which Socorro has talked about, it was as if we had rehearsed this, um, that, you know, how do we how do we balance as a community being at the leading edge, understanding how fintech is evolving, how emerging technologies are evolving and changing what we do and how we might need to respond, but also balance that with also the 
if I can put it this way, the day-to-day business as usual work that is ever the case for our supervisors around regulatory reporting, AML, CFT, uh, risk identification, all of those, all of those things. How do we, how do we kind of make sure that our that our uh, experimentation covers both of those poles? Um, and that we are bringing kind of the best of technology to really focus our efforts in those in those key areas. Um, and so that's a really key area, priority area for us, Jennifer, in the next six months. And my team is hard at work uh, doing that. And so uh, if, if colleagues on this call are interested in finding out more, um, please, please do do get in touch. We would be delighted to have you involved. Um, and then, of course, we are continuing with our wider supervisory um, technology remit, uh, continuing to think about, you know, where are there emerging areas that are coming into the regulatory perimeter that could take that would benefit from a tech first approach. Uh, and obviously, di the digital asset supervision uh, and, and uh, green finance supervision are obviously key areas around this. But also thinking about, as I said, some of those knottier legacy challenges that um, that could benefit from, uh, I would say, maturing technology. When I first started in the subtech field, you know, often the challenge we had when experimenting with technology and things around reg reporting, for example, was the technology wasn't quite mature enough to really be, you know, deployed at scale. Um, I think we have seen such an acceleration over the last few years that I think some of the things that, you know, were really quite tricky for us to tackle uh, have now come back onto the table, if you like. And I would put some challenges around the reg reporting space squarely, squarely in that space. So, you know, everybody on this webinar now wants to be invited to something called a tech sprint, right? I mean, well, this why would you not? Yeah. I've just told you you're going to get locked in a room for two days and think think big thoughts under a cold towel. I mean, no, I don't I mean, think I could have sold it any harder. <laughs> what I find inspiring about this is, is we're taking technology out of the sort of clouds and bringing it down to like our everyday life. And every single one of us can think of things that we would like to improve. And we yeah. don't, sometimes we don't know if the technology could do that, but we know that something needs to be done. So that's, that's fabulous. Yeah. All right. So let's go into, uh, there's already some questions in the chat with you, which you have answered Francesca. So that's great um, uh, with that, with that answer, but we'll come back to the questions. Um, one more round from me though. So Socorro thinking about going ahead and this question is also in the chat. Um, what would you like to see in terms of international collaboration on, on technology and these issues of the challenges that you've laid out, which I think are very typical for supervisors? Um, some of the things Francesca mentioned, how would you like to see it on an international level, that collaboration? Um, I think that uh, what the BIS Innovation Hub is, 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 is doing is, is great. I think it, it, it is going to help a lot. In general, we we need a lot of uh, help with capacity building uh, uh, in in all supervisory agencies uh, across the emerging world and all oh, developed world too. But uh, it's uh, probably the the press of uh, scarcity of resources is is more more uh, uh, important in in the emerging world. Uh, we do need to exchange information about uh, new risks that are emerging, uh, about the subtech um, technology that works. I mean, what, what have some countries done that is helping them deal with the new risks and is helping their financial institutions uh, to deal with the new risks? So an information exchange on, on what works, what has already been proven, in, in some countries would, would be great. Um, and uh, also, uh, of course, there, there needs to be some exchange of, of information regarding uh, cybersecurity uh, among countries to, to try to be, uh, uh, keep pace with the innovation of, 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 of the criminal side, of the dark side, because the dark side innovates all the time and it's, uh, it's creating threats uh, all over the world. And some things that happen in one place in the world are replicated later on in another place. Uh, so they, they, the criminals learn from each other. So we have to learn faster from each other. 
Um, and then the, the other thing where collaboration is, is uh, important is uh, uh, some, some sort of uh, conversation or, or standards for big techs. We need to deal with the systemic nature and concentration of, of, of these big techs in, in providing services to our financial system and to the a lack of jurisdiction that most countries have regarding big techs. And uh, so how are we together going to work on this? And this is a very, it's gonna be a very challenging issue, especially in, a, in if, if the world keeps on getting fragmented. So we, we, we have to deal with that. Uh, it is gonna be a big test on our will, our capacity to collaborate on something that is critical to all of us. Um, so those are those are the main things I think. Uh, uh, I... Sorry, technology. I needed to take off the mute. So thank you, that, uh, Francesca. So just the last word on. I'm taking you back to the clouds now. Uh, so so the the last word on what you think in terms of technology. What what's going to have the most impact on supervisors and central banks? So I mean I think. Um... You know, I think the words on everybody's lips are at the moment, isn't it, is, a, is around generative AI and large language models. I think, you know, you can't really avoid uh, avoid that at the moment, either in our personal lives or our professional lives. Um, and I think, you know, one of the, I think there's a real spectrum, uh, again, exactly to Socorro's point, if I can just build on that uh, in this space, is kind of there i think there's a real spectrum uh for some and they are there are a few there are not many there are a few uh, authorities who are actively experimenting with generative ai and the role it can play but actually i think there is a much larger group of authorities who would benefit and be support and are interested in going okay let me help help me understand this what is this what does it mean how can i start to kind of hold it up to the light if you like and and, and explore it and understand it understand the risks understand the opportunities you know how is it being used you know by maybe the firms that i supervise how might i how might we consider using it i think there is a there is a whole host of kind of knowledge transfer and exploration and safe spaces for these kinds of conversations with colleagues who you know might have the same questions might have a you know different different set of questions so i think um but i think we are that we you know there is still you know the 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 potential for that is extraordinary um i was uh, at a panel discussion a couple of months ago and i was sat next to someone from industry who was kind of waxing lyrical about how wonderful generative ai was and how it had accelerated their path to production for their tools from six months to six weeks you know I, this is you know and uh, and i kind of sat next to him aghast because i thought you know actually a lot of us are having conversations about you know how how do we kind of get to grips with what this thing is and so i think there is there is um there is quite a kind of a, a potential delta uh, there between the industry and and uh, and, and uh, the conf confidence and comfort levels to really understand uh, uh, what this what the, the implications are. Um, that being said, I think it has quite a lot you know a lot of potential and it is uh, very well worth exploring. But the other thing I would say is you know uh, I think one of the challenges we face in the space of technology because it is moving so quickly is how you kind of keep a spread an eye on the things that are new uh, and worth exploring and worth engaging with but also actually that sort of long tail of um of of activity which um you know uh is your bread and butter and is the things that you do every day and whether that's around you know what kind of data strategy do you need what kind of subtext strategy you need and i've seen some of the questions coming through around that i think you know um you know the the potential of emerging technologies is fabulous and we've talked about ai and i also think there is a a lot that we shouldn't lose sight of around existing technology that could be further explored and examined um, uh, for for its utility for us as a community as well. Okay, thanks. So uh, I'm going to bring you back to AI right away because there's a there's a question in the chat. Maybe we'll get Socorro to opine first, and then then you. What which is uh, can supervisors use AI? So. 
I think Francesca addressed the, it, it's a bit worrisome when you hear some of the hyperbole in the industry about what can be done and what they're thinking about and we have to catch up. Um, but in terms of from the supervision side, are we gonna be able to use AI? I mean, you know, one thing I think about are these, for example, in market regulation, you would think about those vast trading data sets and, and surely AI is going to be helpful for that, but I can barely use chat GPT. So I'm not the person to opine on that. It just seems intuitive, but uh, I don't know. So Coral, what do you think AI has, has potential? Uh, well, I personally can't use it either, but <laughs> my supervisory teams are already experimenting and, and using it for some, some purposes. Uh, there is a, uh, uh, machine learning and things like that that are helping us. In, in uh, at least, I have two examples that we are using. In, in one for anti-money laundering, um, in helping us, uh, we receive a lot of uh, reports of suspicious transactions, and those are basically unstructured data. And so, the use of of, of some te of, of technology to help us uh, relate. Uh, a report with another one or to, to, to see if this case, this report helps build up a case for something else. So that, and, and to understand what are the key drivers and to prioritize which reports need analyzing and which don't, that is a use that is already being um, um, made in Peru and, and, and it's, it's working. It's starting to work because it's, it's an early stage. And the second use that, uh, we have so far has to do with um, examining consumer complaints in in um, okay. Okay. social media. Uh, basically, uh, a, a year ago we had a service that would give us uh, well, basically flag some of the important phrases that. Uh, or were related to financial institutions and the the, the issues. Uh, but the, the service had limitations, so now we we were working with with uh, technical assistance, and we're building something that uses machine learning to basically analyze much more volume of information, much faster, uh, to be able to identify what are the, the the aspects that consumers are complaining about, and uh, so that go is worked into our supervisory processes to see if there is a need to pay attention, more attention to an aspect of supervision or to make a change in regulation or things like that, or, or, or needs to uh, give alerts to the financial institutions about of that. About that. So, so those are two examples that we're using. I think it is, it has, this is just also, again, the tip of the iceberg. We, um, we uh, would like to, to use it for, examining the the several of the reports that we receive from from, fin from financial institutions that are not the statistical reports but the, the the other type of reports that we receive that take a, for instance external audit reports or internal audit reports uh, those are very cons uh, resource consuming to be examined if you can uh, without examining each individual report, um, get a way to prioritize which one is more important than the others, you will save resources. So there are many ways. This is fantastic. It, is, it has a lot of potential. Yeah, with that, and, and, and the resource saving is, is, is really important. I mean, I know working in different countries uh, for, the, for the IMF, we see a lot of data quality issues, yeah. which would be one thing underlying, you know, your ability to do that, but it might also reveal them and help you figure that out. So it's just something that occurred to me about the, the and I think I'm, I've stolen one of Francesca's lines by the look of it. So Francesca, soup tech and AI. <laughs> um, so I think, I mean, yeah, to echo Socorro's points, I think um, from our vantage point, you know, we have seen uh, authorities have used AI, whether that's 
unsupervised or supervised machine learning uh, in various guises for several years now across a range of different use cases. Um, so I think, uh, so I, you know, there, there, it is definitely being used. Um, uh, and and used in a variety of ways. And I think uh, if I can kind of conceptualize a couple of uh, kind of key ways, you know, obviously it's about reducing manual effort. So, you know, the review of, you know, large packs of unstructured information that you have to read through, um, you know, how, uh, how, techn how things like natural language processing can really help you pick up uh, the key, the key theme, sentiment analysis on social media posts, for example, um, you know, Another thing is around uh, identifying patterns. So, Socorro, you talked about, um, you know, closing down an app only for it to pop up under uh, in, in another guise somewhere else the next day around fraudulent activity. Um, how you can use, you know, pattern recognition to understand the connections of the people who are running those kinds of things and be able to track and, and monitor those um, much more uh, uh, in, a, in an automated fashion rather than relying on your staff to be kind of trawling through and, and working out where those patterns exist. Um, mm -hmm. And then into the predictive space, you know, how can you use data to understand and identify connections and where uh, and where issues might be arising? And I think we have seen you know, uh, various techniques and tools over the last five or so years that really, really speak to that. As I touched on, I think, you know, this emerging generation of, of AI around generative AI, you know, we are seeing a few uh, agencies who are actively engaged, but we're also seeing a lot that are curious, if I can put it like this, you know, wanting to press their nose up against the glass and understand it in, in more detail. Um, understand how their firms might be using it but also how they they might might use it as well so i think i think there is a huge amount but as you said rightly so jennifer there is a huge amount that and i think it touches maybe on another question in the chat around what enables a subtech strategy data i mean socorro's talked about it unstructured data structured data um you you know it you you need to think about your subtech strategy along with your data strategy the two need to go kind of hand in hand uh, when thinking about it and again thinking about kind of therefore the multidisciplinary effect you know your 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 data gurus your technologists your smes all need to come together in, in thinking about how can we best enable the use and adoption and experimentation oh, with technology. Exactly. Thanks. You know, that that leads us to, a, I thought, a really good question, which is, so we've talked a bit about international collaboration. I, I really want to hang on to the points about sharing practice and what's worked and what hasn't worked, because I, I think that's key. And Socorro, both of you made that point. But Socorro, internally, how do you get people to talk to each other? All of us work in institutions. We know that 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 the IT guys speak a different speak. That so internally, Francesca talked about it a bit in a tech sprint in terms of industry and what, and 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 within the regulator as well. But in a practical sense, inside a supervisor, how do you get people to talk to each other? Um, I don't know. We 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 do have some uh, committees, in, internal committees, that are multidisciplinary. Uh, like for instance, we have a go data uh, digital governance uh, committee that it deals with that, and it includes people from the law department and from the technical information department and from the research department and supervisory. So, and, and they are all sitting together discussing data issues, and and they help help us prioritize where uh, our 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 plans for the next year and and. We do have a very limited, well, limited uh, IT resources internally. And then so we have to say, OK, we have this much resources. What are we going to use these resources for? And then you have all the areas competing with uh, against each other to present their plans and say, my plan is better than yours, uh, different sectors, different. Uh, so that they do talk to each other. I mean, that doesn't mean that they always agree. But but there's there is there is a information exchange and and, and dialogue uh, in, in in our institution. I don't know if if, if that is unusual or not. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, I mean, it, I mean, it speaks to though internal culture and how important it is. Yeah. In as well. So 
All right. So related to that, Francesca, banks talking to supervisors, always a fraught topic. So someone has a question, how do you get the industry talking to supervisors on the same wavelength? It sounds to me like you do a bit of that at, at the innovation. Yeah. Hub. yeah. Um, if I could just add a couple of points actually on the previous question, because I think it's such an important one. And I, you know, it sounds like Sakura, you've got it, you've got it sussed about how to how to do this. But if I could add a couple of points, I think tone from the top is really important. The kind of tone of an expectation of we as a leadership group think that, you know, collaboration, coming together, utilizing data is is really important and 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 setting and maybe setting that expectation i think is what we have as i have observed is is very very powerful in enabling that but also then thinking about how can you create communities of practice across your organization of people who you know who are maybe kind of enthusiastic first adopters who uh, yeah. uh really so want to kind of you know they see it you know we all know these people um you know they they see an opportunity they've seen something they want to understand it more they think there is something that they can contribute and i think it's around you know how that 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 uh, that community is fostered and, and and nurtured to bring that insight in because they will often be your super connectors as well within organizations. Mm. They will know the people who are experiencing similar challenges. And I think and I think that's that kind of you know the importance of the, the formal roots and the governance roots as Sakura as, as talked about is 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 absolutely fundamental. And alongside that, I think kind of that tone from the top, but also how you foster communities. Um, mm. Sorry, you asked me a question, Jennifer, around no, uh, engaging. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I let me let me caveat my response by saying, you know, I am not a supervisor. Uh, uh, I came from the UK's regulator, conduct regulator. I now am in at the BIS. Um, but what I do have a lot of experience of. Uh, successful or otherwise is how do you create the spaces for conversation with industry um and that's can be culturally and behaviorally really challenging um because uh you know the starting point is often very different and the expectations might be very different but i think it's really important you know i saw this in my previous role you know, in order to really understand what technology could do for us as an organization, as was, we needed to understand how it was being used by the regulatory technology community, you know, and, and to get that inspiration in. And so how do you create the spaces for tech fairs, what things we, you know, we, 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 called technos where you would invite firms in to showcase their technology um and and, and ask questions and and probe at it and learn from it and so i think it's around creating the spaces with the right frameworks the right um guardrails in place to do that in a way that engenders confidence and security because obviously you are making a step change in that within the biz innovation hub in terms of the delivery of our work we uh, we partner with the private sector a lot in the in the delivery of our projects um, uh, and the London Centre of the Biz Innovation Hub is no different. Um, and, you know, we, we do that for a couple of reasons, being really clear eyed that often the 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 private sector has uh, a line of sight into uh, uh, and use of technology and, and, and types of technology that we simply don't have. It's around capacity, it's around capability. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so, you know, thinking about how we create those, uh, those partnerships, again, safely and securely and with the right parameters and guardrails in place is, has been, we give a lot of thought to, we, we, we are very intentional about it. You know, and uh, uh, the year before last, we ran a tech sprint on our project Rosalind in London, which was a retail CBDC project. We opened up what we had built, which was a set of APIs, uh, and we invited the private sector to come in and build on the APIs that we had created. Uh, the, my team did an enormous amount of work before we even pressed the kind of go live button on the expressions of interest to make sure that we had our legal colleagues supporting us, our procurement colleagues supporting us, our comms colleagues supporting us. And again, I think it goes back to that kind of multidisciplinary group, you know, who are your core enablers to help you safely engage with the private sector, maybe in a way you haven't done before. 
But I'd also say that one of the things that we shouldn't lose sight of is the relationships with academia. You know, who in your university sectors are doing really exciting things, who might be experimenting with something for the first time, um, you know, and it might then make the leap and the transfer over into the private sector. But, you know, but kind of understanding who is doing interesting things and where within your communities and thinking about your communities in a really broad sense, the regulated sector, the academic sector, um, who's on the edge of the regulatory perimeter um, is a help is would I, I would suggest is another helpful way to look at it. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. There, there's a, I'm gonna come back to you with this provocative question about whether you have a benchmarking tool, but just uh, to, to uh, we often, well, maybe I'll ask you now. So we often get asked this at the IMF, how do you benchmark good regulation? Um, and of course we use the, the core principles from the Basel Committee to benchmark on a broad high level, you know, how is supervision being carried out? But the question for, for you in the chat is, how do you have you are you developing a tool that will help regulators bench themselves against others in terms of how they're handling all of this digital maturity i believe is the is the phrase yeah you. no uh, because that's not in our remit <laughs> is, is, the, is the short answer and i'm sorry to disappoint uh, the 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 participant who, asked question. The question, who was hoping maybe i could point them to a neat little link and uh, that's not within our remit in the biz innovation hub so we, we haven't been doing that but there are others uh, the IMF included, the World Bank, who do a huge amount of work to understand kind of the capacity and the capability of, of institutions uh, uh, on this journey and actually what are the building blocks to go on this journey of digital transformation within within your organisation. Um, uh, and I think that, and there are also kind of communities and network building. So we in the Innovation Hub host an innovation network of um, practitioners across the central banking community who have an interest in innovation across the different domains that we work in. So there are there are communities to tap into, and I would encourage you know we, you know Sakura, you talked so much about the importance of knowledge sharing and capacity building, and how do you maybe you know not reinvent the wheel and learn from your peers and build on your peers and then feed that information back into the community. So I would I would encourage participants to seek out those sources of information. Um, and obviously the Toronto Centre is a, is, a, is a wonderful example in that space as well. Yeah, thank you. I mean, every time you talk to Socorro, you learn A, how much, how complicated it is, which means benchmarking at good luck. And then you learn like practically how much still being done. So uh, yeah, I, I, you just have to talk to Socorro for a while and you realize how hard that would be. So Socorro, I'm gonna give you uh, the last word. I will speak to the training thing in a, in a minute, but you have a couple of questions in here about handling disruptors and handling third party service providers uh, and how you manage that. And you talked a little bit uh, about your new entrants um, but any particular tips on how you prioritize, how you focus, what you think about? Sure, good. I, I, I really don't understand the question. So there was a question on, on how do you approach third-party service providers? Because I guess one of the things in technology is that there's a lot of outsourcing and a lot of third-party yeah. service providers. So that was one. Yeah. I think sorry, okay. so the other okay. question. Yeah, I think the other question's already been answered. So go ahead. Yeah, well, in general, our, our regulator, our regulation makes the financial institutions responsible uh, with re regarding their relations with the third party providers. So they they do have to be responsible with what they subcontract, what the what services they are being provided. They are responsible. If they if they buy models from there, they they are from them they are responsible from under for understanding the parameters, understanding the risks that all these uh, third party providers uh, bring to the table. So the regulation puts a lot of the weight on the financial institutions, uh, but but then sometimes when you deal with these cases of service providers that are Related related to unregulated companies like these fraudulent companies, we do not regulate the company, so we, there's there's nothing to approach there. You have to approach this third party provider directly, and then we basically try to meet the local provider 
uh, or uh, uh, and, and we have had some success meeting and discussing things with uh, uh, international uh, credit card companies like Visa, Mastercard. Uh, some success with dealing with uh, uh, Google, or uh, we approach them directly. Uh, but but in general, most of the weight falls on the financial institutions, right. on, on ensuring that the risks that uh, they 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 are the ones taking the risks. So they have to to uh, understand the risks and control them. You took us right back to risk management, culture, governance, all the things that matter <laughs> to make technology successful. It's fantastic. All right. Um, so we are at 10.01 and we're going to wrap up. Thank you so much. This was so interesting. I have more questions. Uh, we could talk another couple hours and we will because uh, you'll both be back, I'm sure. It was a, there are still questions in the chat. Everybody wants to know what's happening. What I took away is the real need for collaboration and practice sharing, the real need for knowledge transfer and fantastic hard job that supervisors are doing with limited resources, Socorro, you know. <laughs> and, and thanks to the BIS for taking a bit of the load to, to experiment on behalf of everyone, which is, I think, incredibly valuable. All right, thanks very much. And uh, everybody have a great day. <laughs>